Shortly after 7 a.m. on June 14th, 1940, the first German troops marched to Paris. Behind them came Nazi cameramen and broadcasters there to cover the arrivals of Hitler's army. The four-year-long German occupation of the ancient city had begun. In October the same year, the Nazis passed a law confiscating all Jewish-owned property. These days, Nazi nutocracy is typically thought of in terms of the priceless works of art stolen from wealthy Parisian Jews, such as the Rothschilds, often on the direct orders of Hermann Goering. On April 17, 1942, Colonel Kurt von Bahr, an officer in the German Red Cross, was placed in overall command of this furniture action. Bear had been taken prisoner during the First World War and become a fluent French speaker, the main reason for his appointment. When Jewish families were forcibly evicted from their homes, often with only a few hours' notice, they were ordered to hand over any pets to friends, leave their keys with neighbours, and board transport to an internment camp. Within hours of the homes being abandoned, a French removal company, hired by the German authorities, would arrive to empty the premises of its entire content. They did so quickly and efficiently, behind them leaving only bare floors and walls, with the rooms stripped of even their light fittings. Trucks then transported the stolen items to a storage depot for onward shipment to Germany. Over the four years of the occupation, hundreds of trains conveyed the content of some 40,000 Paris households and apartments which had once belonged to the 76,000 French Jews who perished at the hands of the Nazis. In Germany, this loot was distributed to families whose homes and possessions had been lost to Allied bombing. It was a policy not without its critics. Some Nazis, for example, objected, not because they were being asked to handle stolen property, because they believed that anything touched by the Jews had been Jewified and was therefore totally unsuitable for area use. In Paris, the Nazis established three distribution centres where the German occupiers could shop for looted Jewish goods at bargain prices. One of the most popular of these was the elegantly designed Parisian department store, the Levita, on the rue Ferbert Saint Jean Martin. This vast store had been created in the 30s as the IKEA of its day by Jewish entrepreneur Ruth Levita. Over four floors and in a spacious basement, it sold reasonably priced household furnishings to customers throughout France. During the occupation, the Levita became a prison camp for 795 Jewish prisoners. They lived behind shuttered windows and locked doors on the fourth floor, at every moment in terror of being deported to an extermination camp. After one inmate had escaped by hiring a removal van, his entire work team were immediately dispatched to Auschwitz. 164 prisoners were sent to the death camps. These slave labourers worked from 6 in the morning to 7.30 each night, seven days a week. They spent their time opening, sorting, cleaning, repairing and selling the contents of the 2,400 crates delivered daily. From these came a seemingly endless torrent of pots and pans, cake moulds, draining boards, baking trays, roasting dishes, glasses, cups, cutlery, measuring bowls, rolling pins, tables, chairs, beds, pianos, clothes, shoes, ornaments, clocks, watches, standard lamps, table lamps, desk lamps, light bulbs, radios and electrical appliances of all kinds. The store had a busy tailoring shop, a radio department servicing the thousands of pilfered wirelesses, and one repairing stolen electrical goods. The prisoner's ordeal only ended with the liberation of Paris in August 1944. In 1945, Kurt von Baer, now a hunted war cradle, sought refuge in Bad's castle 
a former Bavarian monastery. One summer's morning, he dressed carefully in his military uniform, polished his medals, consumed a bottle of vintage champagne, and shot himself in the head. Because Wolf Levita had been murdered by the SS in 1941, the Storms returned to his family after the war. Having no desire to hold on to such a sad and private reminder of their family's tragic past, they rapidly sold the store. It remained unwanted and unused for years, shrouded in blackness with its counters and tills gathering the dust. Then, in November 2000, it was purchased by Euro RSCG, France's largest advertising agency. Its new owners lovingly renovated and restored the long neglected building. Now elegantly furnished and brightly decorated, many still believe it to be haunted by the ghosts of its dark and sinister history. For the full story of this and many other wartime histories, go to www.triumphofthewill.info In my next video in this series, I'll reveal the bizarre and astonishing tale of Erich Jan Hanussen, a Jewish illusionist and multimillionaire who hypnotized Hitler, finance the brown shirts, and entertain senior Nazis with sex cruises 